That's always the popular idea that world historical events like world wars, depressions, pandemics will transform the world and transform fashion. And it often looks that way. For example, if you look at fashion in 1900 and then you look at it in 1920, you go, oh my God, the First World War changed everything. Goodbye corsets, hello brassieres, hello legs. But in fact, if you look more closely, you find it was starting to happen as early as 1908. So what pandemics and wars and depressions do is they speed up what was already happening before them. Welcome everybody. I am Susie Menkes, editor of Vogue International at Condé Nast, and you are listening to my podcast, Creative Conversations. As a journalist reporting on the global fashion industry, I want to take you backstage and give you an insight into my world. Listen to my exclusive conversations with creatives, industry leaders, and those whose voices have some of the greatest impact. I think you might find it interesting and maybe intriguing. Hello, it's so special for me to have you here for the second season of my Creative Conversations podcast. I hope you've all been keeping safe and well since we last spoke. The first four episodes of this season will be dedicated to the four fashion cities, New York, London, Milan and Paris, who are gearing up for the 2021 Ready to Wear shows, but this time it will be different. The latest news from the CFDA, Council of Fashion Designers America, is that New York Fashion Week will be viewed in a digital platform. Plus, they have lost most of the big players normally on the schedule. For this episode, I'm taking you to New York, and I'm joined by my guest, Valerie Steele, who will give us her take on what has been happening for this city. Sweatpants as top sellers, high heels swapped for sneakers, no parties to dress up for. What is happening in the post-COVID world of fashion? Much the same, claims Valerie Steele, who can give us more guidance, a crisp, sharp clarity, and a glimpse of a new world, just as she has studied life back in 1900. The director and chief curator at New York's FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, seems to have more to offer those hungry for fashion than the cancelled seasonal American shows might have done. A decade ago, I called Valerie the Freud of fashion, a name she rather likes, especially since a book each season comes out from this brainy woman whose view of clothing is of intellectual storytelling. The world changes attitudes to women, to the LGBTQT community, and of course, to fashion itself. But when the way we dress takes a fresh step, there's always a reason. Yes, claims Valerie, the system is broken, but the pandemic, like earlier stops for war or climate change, might speed up new attitudes. Gothic glamour, an edgy vision of fashion for LGBTQ folk, and the power of the fan are all subject of her 20 plus books. The fan? Surely you don't need Freud to analyse that. The fan, Valerie is going to tell me, is the woman's sword. So, so Valerie, I'm, I'm so excited about this because we've never really had a chance to talk very much. I mean, yes, about exhibitions, but not necessarily about you and your life and how your career has grown. And um, I really wanted, as all good journalists do, to start from the beginning you know, Valerie, I feel that you've taken the Manhattan Museum at FIT and turned its exhibitions into something quite different. Studies of sex and history and rock and roll, and not necessarily in that order. Can you explain how you were given the freedom as chief curator to create a world-class fashion in the museum at FIT? Well, I don't think anybody is given freedom. I think you always have to take freedom. And my assumption when I was first hired in 1997 as chief curator was that I would be doing the same kind of in-depth research that I did for my books, except that now I will be doing it in an exhibition format. And I think working at a university museum made that easier because the assumption is that if you're working at a university, whether you're a curator or a professor, you have the right to follow your research where it goes. And of course, you, you have to explain why the topic is important and how it's educational, 
But that, that's something that's basically understood. You don't have to say, okay, a million people will come in to see this show and we can make a lot of money and so therefore we'll do it. Instead it will be, this has never been done before. Nobody's had an exhibition on this topic and it's really important. It will help advance our knowledge of fashion if we can do this. Uh, but what's interesting to me, your director and chief curator at FIT, and this has been going on for nearly a quarter of a century, isn't it? 25 exhibitions, if not 25 years. And, yes. you know, I would suggest that quite a lot of them have been on the dark side. I'm thinking of a focus on the corsets, on gothic glamour, and especially that one wonderful exhibition of a queer history of fashion from the closet to the catwalk. Is it you who has a vision of unexpected fashion, or did you want to give an edge to shows that can too often, I'm afraid, seem like yesterday's clothes? I think that that was me. I was drawn to Gothic, which is was a dark show, um, and when my colleague Fred Dennis suggested that we do a show about gay fashion designers, I immediately thought that a queer history of fashion would be so pioneering. It's really the first show that looked at that. Um, and of course, the corset, that was how I entered into fashion history in the first place. I think my shows tend to be a bit edgier than some of my colleagues. I know my colleague Patricia Mears tends to do much more beautiful aesthetic shows, like shows on the glamour of the 1930s or American Beauty or Ballerina, which was probably her most beautiful show. Um, so that's just a question of personality. Everybody has a slightly different take on fashion. But isn't it more than that, Valerie? After all, you are a rare soul in the fashion world because you're not focused entirely on images. You have kept words flowing with your academic journal, which I believe is called Fashion Theory, the Journal of Dress, Body and Culture. Sounds awfully grand. And do you <laughs> think your students actually read it? And what do they have to say about your intellectual intelligence? Well, fashion theory has made a big impact on the field because that was the first scholarly peer-reviewed journal about fashion anywhere in the world. And I know it's had impact on some students because there was a PhD student at Columbia University who wanted to do her doctoral dissertation in the sociology department on fashion in Paris. And her uh, professor said, no, 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 that's not a serious topic. And right at that moment, the first issue of Fashion Theory came out in 1997. And she brought in the copy and slammed it down on her professor's desk and said, there is a scholarly journal on this topic. That proves it's valid for a PhD. And they backed down. And she did her dissertation. I was on her committee. And she's now become a great fashion scholar. So I think people were kind of waiting for this journal because other journals didn't want to deal with fashion. And, and of course, I, I went into it sort of boldly thinking, well, fashion's important. People will realize that. And I made myself essentially unemployable in the world of academia because uh, most academics in history departments thought fashion was a fluffy, silly topic. So I could never get a full-time, tenure-track position as a professor. I had to be an adjunct, which is like an academic proletarian. I was an adjunct at FIT for 10 years, at NYU, at Columbia, at Cornell, at Parsons. I mean, I was teaching all around town. And um, now, finally, people are starting to understand that it's acceptable. But there's still not very many places where you can specifically study fashion. ask you something that may sound slightly hurtful. You can't talk about fashion exhibitions in Manhattan without including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has become famous for its opening event as for its exhibitions. Are there moments, tell me this Valerie honestly, when you have produced an exceptional piece of work like the things you've just been talking about and then you feel like screaming, it's not fair that the Met gets all the worldwide publicity. I would not be human if I didn't occasionally feel envious, particularly about the huge number of people who see the shows at the Met. That, even more than the publicity, um, is something I envy. To have half a million people see your show would be fabulous. But if you thought, well, is she 
gritting her teeth and green with jealousy all the time, that wouldn't be true either because I'm really proud of the shows that we do. And I know that even though we have a much smaller number of visitors, we still have a lot of fans around the world. I've been accosted, you know, in train stations in Japan, all kinds of weird places in Guatemala City on New Year's Eve by people coming up and going, you're Valerie Steele, you're from the museum at FIT. I loved seeing your show online. So I think that we have a more of an audience than you might think, even though, of course, we're a much smaller museum. The, the Met is one of the world's great museums, like the Louvre or, or the Prado. So we couldn't compete with that. But we do really excellent shows, and we have our fans. In fact, you're known way beyond America. You've just been talking about places where you've been stopped in the street, which must be rather rewarding. And haven't you just done an exhibition in Japan? Well, can, can you tell us more about your actual international work? Well, the one in Japan was the first show I've curated in a foreign country. Uh, and it was great fun. They came to me from the Kobe Fashion Museum, and they visited me in New York City a few years ago and, and invited me to guest curate a show. So they paid for me to fly over and look at the collection. And so that was great. I did that chose some of the things I wanted, came home, and I was supposed to go back again when COVID struck. So I had to finish curating the show long distance, which was really frustrating, uh, doing it by images and emails and placing things through diagrams back and forth. But it came up. I didn't get to see it. I did see videotapes of it, and we, we made our own little video to put on the museum's website. It's a great collection there, and I love Japan. Uh, Japan and France are my favorite countries in the world, so it was really fabulous to be able to see. They had amazing Western fashion collection there, amazing 18th century fashions, incredible haute couture, so that was kind of cool. What I was surprised and disappointed was they had hardly any Japanese fashion. And of course, at the museum at FIT, we've built up an amazing collection of hundreds of important Japanese fashions by Kamde Garçon, Yoji, Issei, Sakai, Undercover, um, Number Nine, really great collection. And so I feel like now I have to try and help them build up their Japanese collection. Yes, or so hold your Japanese collection in Japan. That would be a coup. Valerie, you are what we Brits call brainy. But do you feel like that? And I don't know whether you deliberately set out to make your shows intellectual as well as entertaining, or is it just part of your nature that the two things are involved? I'm afraid it's just me. I don't try and make them intellectual. I try and make the intellectual ideas be accessible to everybody. That's something very important to me. It drives me crazy with fashion theory that so many authors write in these very complicated and difficult to understand articles. And I keep saying, yes, we have an audience that's mostly professors and graduate students and curators, but you have to be able to speak so that the members of the general public, the educated non-specialist can understand you. I really try not to use jargon uh, and I try and write clearly so that anyone who's interested in fashion could understand it. I believe you wrote a book about the fan. It was called The Fan, Fashion and Femininity Unfolded. What a title. But what did you learn about the fan? I, I guess there is a lot more to it than keeping cool in countries that do not go in for US-style air conditioning. Well, I was invited to do that book, and I seized the opportunity because I do love fans as objects of art. And I went to the Fan Museum in Greenwich in England. My husband and I went over with an enormous chest full of camera equipment. Uh, not a Hasselblad, but a big camera and a stand. So he, they allowed us to take photographs of you know, 17th and 18th century fans in their collection, fin de siècle fans. So the illustrations, the photographs were so important because I did all this research in ha how the fan was really seen as being like the woman's sword. You know, that, that uh, men had swords and women had fans, and sometimes they do more damage with them, as they said in the 18th century. The fans were a way of flirting and conversing with other people. There was a kind of language of the fan. 
Then one of my favorite French writers from the fin de siècle, Octave Uzan, wrote a whole book about the fan back in the 1880s. And he talked about, again, it being such a symbol of femininity and fashion and flirtatiousness. That was one of the first books of his that I read. And he, of course, was completely obsessed with women and their fashions. He did another book about the sunshade, the muff, and the glove, and other books about Parisian fashion, which explored how women's fashion has really been fetishized by men and seen as sort of sexually symbolic. The muff, for example, I mean, Octave talks about how he remembers putting his hands into the furry, warm, maternal muff, and you go, ah, well, if only <laughs> Floyd was there to hear him. <laughs> think of, dream up an intellectual question for you. Will fashion in America always be different from those countries like my own in the United Kingdom, where instead of going to see a psychiatrist, people might express their tension and drama in art and especially in clothes? What do you think of that as a theory? Well, I think everybody in, in all countries uses clothing often unconsciously to express uh, desires and conflicts and fears. But it's true that in some countries like the UK, there's a much clearer sense of drama and a willingness to be eccentric or provocative. Americans have been brought up in a culture, oddly a more puritanical culture than England, where you're supposed to beware of any occasion that requires new clothes, as Thoreau said. And you have to kind of fit in, be very conformist. So there's a kind of dampening down uh, of the artistic and poetic expressiveness of clothes. It comes out, of course, though, in young people's clothes in all countries. And you see that in the US, urban teenagers, uh, teenagers in general. That's when you're most exploring who you are as a person and you're trying on different costumes and different masks. So that's, I think, where the U.S. has played a role in contributing to the sort of world discourse on fashion and drama and art, coming in through music and youth culture. Well, you certainly contributed. You wrote this book called Fashion and Eroticism, looking at sexual femininity from Victorian to the Jazz Age. How do you really think that female and male fashion are viewed today? Aren't they getting closer together? Isn't there really a blend of the two of them? Yes, it's blurring a lot. The whole idea of um, gender fluid clothing is becoming more and more important. In a way, it's like the movement we already saw in fashion where um, different ethnicities and different nationalities all became part of the fashion mix. Now we're seeing people refusing to look at a gender binary like men's clothes and women's clothes, masculine versus feminine. Now they're playing with each other a lot more than they ever did before, even then in the 1960s. You see this with Gucci, for example, this sort of refusal to say masculinity is this. Um, it's going to be complicated to actually translate to the world at large, though, because clothes are manufactured and sold specifically for men and for women, even when they're ultimately unisex clothes like T-shirts. The sizing and the packaging are all promoted to one gender or the other. But I think that's breaking down. Now, let's ask you the great question that everybody wants to know, especially your fans. Is there one more show you're determined to do to express fashion in the 21st century? What have you got hidden inside that brainy head of yours? Well, you know, it's you who gave me the idea. When you did the article calling me the Freud of fashion, I was so pleased and flattered. And I started to think, gee, I wonder if I could do a book about and an exhibition about fashion and psychoanalysis. I did fashion and eroticism. I did fetish, fashion, sex, and power. But fetish is easy. Is there some way to look at other kinds of unconscious mm, motivations and conflicts, aggressive as well as erotic, that people play out in fashion. So since the pandemic, I've been exploring, researching, and trying to write 
a book about fashion and psychoanalysis. And I think that in a couple of years, I'm going to be doing a big exhibition on that as well. So thank you, Susie. You're the one who inspired me to do this sort of mm, very difficult and complicated, but to me, really fascinating idea about how do ideas like exhibitionism and narcissism, the, de the death drive and eros, how do those all play out in fashion? Madame Freud, can I ask you perhaps a slightly more banal question? Um, there are many US fashion designers, including, say, Calvin Klein and Michael Kors, who studied at the FIT at your place and went on to become successful designers. And they're ones who've built the backbone of New York fashion. Considering the current situation of COVID-19 and the New York shows really barely happening this September, they should be, I should have been going off to look at them next week. In your opinion, what do you think is the future of the fashion industry actually in your own city? I think that fashion is not going to disappear. Fashion will survive because it seems to be hardwired into human beings that you want to make yourself special. And that, I think, is ultimately what fashion's about. And people like Michael Kors and Calvin Klein have been so successful because they gave a personal spin to that. You know, with Calvin, traditionally, it was all, you know, about sexuality. And with Michael Kors, there's this kind of glamour uh, aspect. It's, it's sportswear like New York, but it's a glamorous kind of sportswear. You think of him with the sunglasses and swimming pools in the background of the ads, people hopping out of little planes. That's not going to disappear. And although the fashion shows are a little bit on pause this season because of the pandemic and people's reluctance to travel and move viruses all around the world. I think that fashion and fashion shows are by no means dead. Um, Paris is go still going to be probably the number one world capital of fashion, but there's no question that New York is the capital of American fashion with uh, some manufacturing help from Los Angeles. So I think there's no danger of New York disappearing. And certainly the FIT students are, are coming thick and fast with so many talented students from all kinds of backgrounds. One of the cool things about FIT is there are many kids who are first in their generation to go to college and a lot of children of immigrants. That whole aspect of New York as being, you know, a kind of a new beginning. I remember the late Isabel Toledo saying to me how coming to the U.S. as like a six-year-old from Cuba that really it felt like a new world. That excitement was something that I think a lot of people come to New York and experience, and they bring that to fashion. I mustn't forget that although the museum is in a constant state of fascination for me, there's also more to this institute that you have than the exhibitions that you put on. Do you learn from the students as much as the students learn from the museum? I suppose your own archive must be an incredible source for the students if you offer it to them. Oh, yes. I think there's no question that we learn from the students and the students learn from us. Our exhibitions are what the public sees, but we hold more than 400 classes and tours a year. Many of those are for, obviously, FIT students, and we have a special study collection that they can use, that they can really handle, that are duplicates. Because if we, if we gave them the same Poiré dress for 400 classes a year, it would fall apart in a year. So we have to use duplicates. But they can then get tours of the exhibitions to see the things from the permanent collection. We also have classes for kids as young as five years old and for high school and junior high school students in New York, and from college students around the world, from as far away as Bunka in Tokyo and London College of Fashion, they come to FIT and they, we have classrooms on the second floor of the museum, we give tours to all of these groups, and we learn from that what they're interested in, what they want to see. Um, I remember when I worked on the Gothic show, I had so many young kids, goth kids, coming to see me, these black-clad, so articulate, wonderful kids, that they'd come to the guard at the front desk, and before they even opened their mouth, he'd go, she's on the third floor, because he could recognize at that point who they were coming to see. Uh, yes, it's, well, it's fascinating, because you have so many plans. You're, you're at the same time, 
giving people information and teaching and you're visually um, doing exciting things for them. What actually are the plans for the museum, for FIT, this fall season, this strange season when we're all in lockdown or we don't know where we are really? Well, we're not doing exhibitions in the galleries this fall. Uh, Hopefully things will be able to open up in the spring. We have a whole series of exhibitions planned for the next four years. So it'll, we'll just be moving them along one, one term late. Uh, but we have a very strong program online for the fall. I just interviewed Prabal Gurung. I'm going to be interviewing Robin Givan. We have American Indian artists and designers who'll be in conversation. We've got tremendous array of public programs. And we're also looking at ways that we can show aspects of our collection. For example, I chose some of our Isabel Toledo dresses and we'll have a program where we'll do a kind of deep look into different designers. I chose Isabel, other curators will choose different pieces from the collection. Uh, Daphne Guinness contacted me and she said, oh, she just found some video that she took of her exhibition from years ago. And I said, well, let's put that together. You and I will do an interview on Zoom And we'll edit that with some of your footage and some of our stills, and we'll do a look back and talk about the show. It's been almost 10 years now that we did that show. And so we're doing that kind of thing, and we're planning ahead. Everybody is so busy finishing the plans for the upcoming exhibitions, like Ravishing, The Rose in Fashion, uh, Head to Toe. Many, we have so many exhibitions lined up. We're finishing getting ready for those. We're finishing all the books that come along with them. Um, doing a big book and show with Tashin about shoes, again shoes. But you know, if you want to intrigue people, shoes are where it's at. So we're extremely busy. Um, we'll have so many things online and guest sort of shows online that uh, one of my colleagues anxiously said, Oh, I hope we don't open next spring. We have so much that we're putting online. And I said, it's okay, one way or the other, we're going to have lots of things to share with our audiences. No need to worry. Sufficient unto the day. Your energy is breathtaking, especially at this very difficult time. It looks like after 25 years in the job, you could put another 25 years in, easily thinking up all the dramas that you can show. But is there something different? Are you going to surprise us by leaving your current role to do something different? Are you going to call me up one day and say, you know what you said to me, Susie, when you asked that question? Well, What's the answer? <laughs> No, I'm not. I was thinking about it a few years ago. Should I, you know, end my career in another place and do something new? Um, And ultimately, what I have with my team at the museum at FIT is so precious to me. It's at this point, although it's fun for me to curate shows and write books, that's great, and edit my magazine. What I'm really keen on intensely is trying to help all of these young curators and educators find what their real joy is and what their center is. And they're so talented and so brilliant and they've got so many different ways of looking at things that I'm trying to help them get their PhDs, get their shows on the road, figure out what's going to be their focus in the history of fashion. And so I'm kind of working with this great team to move the next generation ahead in fashion. I I would love to ask you now to bring our fascinating conversation to a close. I'd like to ask you how you really think things are going to change or change now the impact of COVID-19, the working at home, what's the impact of that on our wardrobes? Will we get smarter or more casual? I'm talking about the clothes here, not our brains. But do you feel that really what we're going through now is something lasting, something that you're going to be writing a book about sometime very soon? Well, you know, that's always the popular idea, that world historical events like world wars, depressions, pandemics, will transform the world and transform fashion. And it often looks that way. For example, if you look at fashion in 1900, and then you look at it in 1920, you go, oh my God, the First World War changed everything. Goodbye corsets, hello brassieres, hello legs. 
But in fact, if you look more closely, you find it was starting to happen as early as 1908, way before the World War broke out. And even before that, you had, um, I remember seeing a wonderful thing in Les Modes from 1903, this voluptuous actress, uh, Rejane, and she's being interviewed about fashion. And she goes, what they go, what's, who's your favorite couturier? Worth. Who's your favorite jeweler? The czar. Who's your favorite corseteer? And she goes, I don't need a corset. And you look at her photograph and you go, babe, you are wearing a corset. But it was already, by 1903, supposed to be, you weren't supposed to need a corset if you were young and slim and beautiful. So what pandemics and wars and depressions do is they speed up what was already happening before them. And what's already been happening already for years is the fashion industry, the system, has been broken. Is it the department stores, people getting the, their winter clothes in July and they can't find a bathing suit in August, and everybody wearing sweatpants. Remember, it was years ago that Karl Lagerfeld said, if you give up, wear sweatpants, it means you've given up. It's the end. And now everybody, but everybody's been wearing sweatpants for years. Ever since they had Casual Friday and all these guys came in wearing clothes that looked like they were going to clean the basement, and people went, no! That casualness has been there, but it's not for everybody. They are also all the people who are still dressing up and who are shopping online and, and dying to have a thing to wear for it. So I think that just as the empire of fashion broke into little style tribes many years ago, the pandemic is exaggerating that. Yes, there's the athleisure style tribe, yoga pants, sweatpants, t-shirts, hoodies, but they, those guys have been around for years. There's also the ones who are gonna be all for the latest crazy wild Instagram thing. And then there'll be those who are thinking, mm, I want a uniform, but I want a really chic uniform. And they'll be looking to buy something maybe that they can wear and keep and will look fabulous for years. So all those things that were happening before are gonna be even more exaggerated by the, the time of the pandemic. Some people are going to run out of the house in heels that are this high, and some people are going to hobble out like me going, gosh, can I even fit in a high heel anymore? I haven't worn a high heel for six, eight, ten months. So that's the war, the pandemic, the whole changes of the last year, which have transformed our lives so profoundly, may not actually transform our fashions but as profoundly, but they will help continue to transform the fashion system. The parts that were broken before can't be glued back together. We're going to have to come for new ideas. Maybe not so many fashion collections a year. Maybe some people thinking in terms of two a year. I remember when you wrote the article saying how having six, eight, ten collections a year, this is killing all these designers. It's one thing for a big house to do, but the young independents, and people are going crazy trying to keep up with this. Well, I have one thing to say by way of saying farewell to you, that I think anybody looking for a brilliant idea about fashion should come straight to Valerie Steele. Thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, Susie, thank you so much. This was so fun. Thanks a mil. How fascinating to hear from Valerie Steele, her fascination with fashion, her academic role as director of New York's FIT school, and her intellectual vision of the clothes we wear. The idea of bringing psychology to fashion and its sudden changes offers an intriguing vision of today's gender fluidity on the streets and in the closet. It is fascinating to understand how wide is the reach of Valerie as an intelligent educator who is recognized from Guatemala to Japan. Valerie, who lives with her husband John, a scholar in ancient Chinese history, has turned fashion into a torrent of interesting and intriguing words. She certainly has a continuing stream of intellectual thoughts about what we wear and why. Next week it's the turn of London Fashion Week and I shall be talking to Sir Paul Smith, who's celebrating 50 years in fashion. Creative Conversations with Susie Menkes is produced by Natasha Cowan and edited by Tim Thornton with music by Jörg Zuber and graphics by Paul Wallace. 
To find my articles, visit the fashion channel of vogue.co.uk and at Susie Menke's Vogue on Instagram. If you've enjoyed the podcast, then please do rate, review, subscribe and tell your friends. You can find me on Apple, Spotify, Google and all the usual channels.